Hello. In this section, we'll take a look at pancreas and biliary tract pathology. Well, pancreatic pathology, we'll take a look at inflammation and clearly define what is acute and what is chronic. And at the very end, we'll take a look at pancreatic cancer. And in management and pharmacology, it's important that you pay attention to the molecular mechanism of pancreatic cancer, namely KRAS. When we get into biliary tract, we'll be placing those pathologies such as gallstones in play and uh, make sure that we give you proper clinical presentation so that you get your questions correct. Pancreatitis will divide in acute and chronic. As far as you're concerned, it'll be very black and white. Your patient with acute pancreatitis may be an, adu it's an adult who's been drinking alcohol excessively, a common cause of acute pancreatitis. Or maybe it was a child who suffers from a CFTR chromosome 7 genetic issue, such as cystic fibrosis. There would be interstitial pancreatitis and necrotizing pancreatitis that we shall take a look at in greater detail under acute. When we switch over to chronic, and I will tell you how you will be doing that symptomatically, our topic here will be further expanded upon by looking at the pancreatic pseudocyst. And eventually, there is so much damage that's taking place with the pancreas over the long run that there really isn't much pancreatic functioning left, referring to insufficiency. Acute pancreatitis, by definition, everything in pancreas is going absolutely crazy. In your head, you should be thinking about the pancreas and divide it into two physiologic organs. And by that I mean you divide it into exocrine pancreas and you divide it into endocrine pancreas. Initially, when there's damage that's taking place to the pancreas, it is all these enzymes that are being released. And in your head, you should also be thinking about, well, those enzymes from the pancreas that are responsible for protein digestion include trypsin, carboxypeptidase, endopeptidase, and so forth, trypsin being the most potent. If you're dealing with the enzymatic or exocrine pancreas and you wish to metabolize your lipid, and then that discussion takes you to lipase. In any case, that's a lot of enzymes within the pancreas, is it not? And all these enzymes are being re released locally. You might have utmost enzymatic destruction, resulting in a term called autodigestion. Important etiologies that we'll take a look at. Alcohol being quite common. This pain that the patient's feeling is not only epigastric, but then also radiating to the back. When the time is right, I will then give you a list of differentials quickly to have you uh, differentiate between different types of epigastric pain. Gallstones could also be a possible cause of pancreatitis, and we'll talk about that in greater detail, and it's a nice little story. In other words, you had a gallstone that was in my gallbladder, ended up in my biliary tree, and eventually makes its way to the second part of the duodenum, in which it may then cause what's known as compression atrophy. Other causes, also hypercalcemia, may cause damage to the pancreas. And, for example, if you have a patient that has a type 4 type of hyperlipidemia, or even worse case, a type 1 hyperlipidemia, if you remember correctly, type 1 hyperlipidemia is a deficiency of your capillaproprotein lipase. And if that lipoprotein lipase is not present, up goes my calomicron, oh my goodness, my triglyceride levels are ridiculously high. Thousands. The first organ to be damaged here would be the pancreas. Drugs. I'll give you a list of drugs here that cause acute pancreatitis. We have AZA, azathioprine, we have pentimidine, and we have hydrochlorothiazide being important drugs. There's more to come. Infections, such as mumps. With mumps, even though it might be rare, you want to keep this in mind because it may then cause parotitis or chitis. I uh, probably in my best interest not to grab my testicles. We have Coxsackie virus, and we also have parasites. that may all cause acute pancreatitis. The embryologic issue that you might have called pancreatic ductus divisum. And remember, with the uh, proper embryologic development, you have the, the ventral head and the, the dorsal head. And all of this may then result in an uh, abnormal type of uh, division called a ductus Divisum. Or there might be inherited autosomal dominant disorder resulting in acute pancreatitis. Interesting enough, you were uh, performing a procedure 
in which you were trying to identify the pathology in your uh, bile duct. In the process, you actually ended up causing damage to the pancreas. That's a risk factor when implementing endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. That post-exam, you might actually bring about damage to the pancreas or just straight up blunt trauma to the abdomen. Important etiologies for acute pancreatitis. Vascular, we have ischemia or perhaps vasculitis resulting in acute pancreatitis. Miscellaneous include, well, importantly, cystic fibrosis. So imagine that, imagine that child that has extremely viscous fluid within his or her ducts. Most likely a child of Caucasian descent and with that viscous type of fluid within the ducts, not only could it result in what's known as your bronchiectasis and eventually result in pneumonia because you have increased thickness there, but they might have increased thickness within the pancreatic duct. So therefore, anatomy, the pancreatic duct is moving towards the second part of the duodenum. The fluid is moving in that direction. If you end up having all this viscous fluid within your duct, imagine now that you may then cause backup congestion and compression and eventual acute pancreatitis, an important point. Or the two types of ulcers that we discussed earlier. If your patient is giving you the following symptoms initially, hey doc, I have this pain at midnight, late at night when I'm asleep. <laughs> I have to go downstairs to the kitchen, I have to open up the fridge and I end up having a, uh, a pretty decent uh, amount of cake that we had for uh, y yesterday's birthday. And it actually, the pain then, then went away. So initially, what I'm giving you here are the symptoms of duodenal peptic ulcer disease, in which a the pain then has been relieved by eating. But then eventually what may then happen, if not properly taken care of, is that this may then perforate. And when it perforates, imagine where you are, a duodenal peptic ulcer disease. Where are you? Think. First part of the duodenum. If you were to perforate through, you may then cause damage to the gastroduodenal artery and, in fact, then bring about damage to the pancreas. Important. Miscellaneous, yes, but incredibly clinically important. Signs and symptoms. As I told you, I'll give you some important epigastric pain issue. Here, with acute pancreatitis, the patient is definitely feeling pain in the abdomen, but then it radiates to the back because of the retroperitoneal type of uh, journey of the head of the pancreas towards the tail, meaning to say that it's going to meet up with the spleen, is it not? If this gets damaged, then the patient is also expressing pain in the back as well. I just gave you another uh, epigastric pain where the pain then went away after consuming food, and that's your duodenal peptic ulcer disease. Or you could have a patient with epigastric pain, and, and it does not radiate to the back, in which the pain gets worse immediately after eating. And that would be gastric type of peptic ulcer disease. Epigastric pain, their differentials become important here. Low-grade fever, nausea and vomiting are signs and symptoms that you can expect, but, I mean, not really, you'd, you'd be finding that with any type of uh, itis. So, uh, obviously, giving you more information. There might be tachycardia, orthostasis, or perhaps even ileus due to obstruction. And a couple important things here. These might be rare in clinical discovery. However, keep in mind, because if you find something like this in stem of a question, or you see a picture of what's known as Cullen sign, in other words, there'll be hemorrhage around the umbilicus, C-U-U-M. Cullen is bleeding around the umbilicus. Or there might be hemorrhage in the flanks, and the flanks would be the sides of your body, out about towards the hips, and basically where you find your kidneys. Are we clear? And around there, if you ended up finding uh, hemorrhage, you'd then call this more or less hemoperitoneum, or retroperitoneal hemorrhage. This is referred to as being your gray Turner sign. Rare as it may be, keep this in mind because remember, on your boards, they have to give you specific information so that you're moving in a certain direction and you're choosing one answer choice over the other with almost utmost confidence. Now, with that said, obviously, there's always, there's always going to be a little bit of doubt. Trust me. Always. But that's okay, though. As long as you choose the most educated educated answer, then you'll be in good shape, you move on. Lab testing for acute pancreatitis specifically. 
Keep in mind that amylase and lipase may be found, but which one's more specific for acute pancreatitis, in fact, is lipase. Something interesting yet once again that we'll see is that the enzymes that you would find to be elevated in acute pancreatitis may not correlate with the severity of the disease. We had this very discussion when we did liver disease and the transaminases. Even though the transaminases being elevated will tell you that the patient most likely has liver disease, it does not correlate with the severity. Same concept here as well. Serum liver function test, if elevated, may then suggest gallstone pancreatitis. We will talk about gallstones in great detail. And with gallstones, at least think about this before we actually get to the details. You could have a stone that begins in the gallbladder. Let's say it's a cholesterol stone or a pigment stone if there's bilirubin. That stone may then escape from the cystic duct and you are then moving throughout the biliary tree. And as, you move, as the stone then moves through the biliary tree, which is then technically called your cholodocolithiasis, understand that you might have compression issues and also injury that might be taking place in the adjacent organ, including the liver, and then also including the pancreas. We'll talk more later. It's important. Imaging studies, you'll do an abdominal and stop chest x-ray. What? Now, understand what this, what's going on here. Don't just memorize this. Where is the pancreas located? Right, in the abdomen, okay, then why the chest? Do you, is there such a thing in which you have a hernia in which a pancreas comes up in the thorax? Are you kidding me? I suppose anything's possible. But listen, this is why you're doing a chest x-ray. This pancreas has been damaged, okay? You do an abdominal x-ray and you might find, quote-unquote, a sentinel loop. Stop. The pleural fusion and ARDS have nothing to do with the abdomen. And why is it associated with pancreatitis? Enzymes. Hmm. What's ARDS mean? Acute respiratory distress syndrome. It means that the alveoli have been destroyed. There's every possibility that enzymes being released from the pancreas into circulation may then cause damage to the lung extensively to the point where the uh, pleural cavity may then develop fluid and the alveoli may then perish. Is that clear? Therefore, what you're looking for in chest x-ray would be atelectasis. CT, useful for evaluation of complications. Normal in about 30% of your patients, however. ERCP, reserved for therapeutic interventions. And by that we mean that, remember, ERCP itself, even though you're trying to explore what's going on with the pancreas and what's causing damage, in the process you might actually cause damage to the pancreas. So be careful with the ERCP. So it could be diagnostic, but then also be an etiology of lesion. MRCP obviously playing a much greater role. We have MRI, is what the MR stands for, and it's non-invasive, increasingly replacing the ERCP for obvious purposes. We have something called Ranson's criteria for acute pancreatitis. So I've given you a bunch of criteria in medicine, especially with the uh, GI system. But what's most important about the criteria is that you understand the concepts and at least know the name and what type of disease and what organ system that you're in. And that'll help you out tremendously. For example, if you talk about MELD, and that'll be the model for end-stage liver disease. If we say Duke, you're thinking about GI system. If you're thinking about Gleason, the prostate system, you're thinking Ann Arbor classification, Hodgkin. Remember all these, right? Now, some of these you'll have to know a little bit more detail than others. But nonetheless, know what organ system. The other one that comes to mind is Jones criteria for uh, rheumatic fever. On admission, older patient, acute pancreatitis. Itis means inflammation. It should be of no surprise that you found leukocytosis. Itis of whom? The pancreas. There's every possibility that the uh, insulin might be affected. Then what happens to glucose? Hyperglycemia. Don't just memorize it. Analyze everything that I'm saying here. Because you have the understanding now. Okay? That's the power that you have now. Is the fact that you have all this information in your head. And everything that's being presented here, you're actually understanding what's going on. It's beautiful. It really is. You have lactate dehydrogenase and AST that might be elevated. Meaning to say that now you start involving your liver and company, especially AST. 
on admission within, tw- within two days, 48 hours. Now, at this point, your Metacrit drops greater than 10%. And now you're thinking about anemia kick in. Kidneys might be affected with BUN rising. Calcium is going to diminish. Diminish. The more this calcium starts dip- dropping or it starts uh, depositing on your damaged tissue, what kind of calcification is this? Good. Dystrophic calcification. Also, with these enzymes causing damage to the lung, two days later, you find that your PO2, what's your normal PO2 in the uh, artery? Approximately 100, right? About 95, 100. You drop down to 60. This is not good. You have damage to the lung. And base defect, and you have fluid deficit of greater than 6 liters. That's important. Something called third spacing. Fluid deficit of greater than 6 liters. You've heard of third spacing. Give me some examples of third spacing. How about third degree burns? Severe burns in which now the fluid is escaping into your tissue. Pancreatitis, there's every possibility that third spacing might be a possibility. See, patient is actually hypovolemic and is therefore presenting with hypotension. So therefore, why are we looking at this? Greater than three risk factors, mortality rate, 15%. You double this, and you have six of these risk factors, mortality rate, it doesn't get any worse than this, 100%. Acute pancreatitis, what is your management? Supportive care, step by step. Bowel rest, IV fluid, your patient is hypovolemic, your patient's in pain, so much so that your patient might actually become addicted on narcotics. When's the last time you've heard of that? What's this patient? Young African-American boy, playing quite a bit, and complains of, oh, pain in the chest, oh, the, uh, pain in the hands. Sickle cell disease, dactylitis, pain, 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 analgesia there as well. Almost 100% of those patients with sickle cell disease will also be addicted to narcotics. Antibiotics, pancreatitis, you're worried about abscess formation. Antibiotics are often empirically given and definitely reserved for your necrotizing type of pancreatitis. You're absolutely worried about infection setting in. This is not good. Antibiotics empirically. Continue here with the pancreas. <laughs> it's the organ for proper digestion. My goodness, every food group that we consume, pancreas plays a role. Trypsin and company protein, lipase, lipid, insulin, glucagon, all that's carbohydrates. Granted, some is endocrine and some is exocrine, but plays a huge role. So therefore, acute pancreatitis, you're definitely worried about proper nutrition. Parental nutrition, ERCP for duct reception, disruption, I mean to say they might be, you need to remove a stone, but be careful with that. It might cause damage. And if there is going to be abscesses and pseudocysts, we'll talk about in a little bit, then drainage of infected pancreatic collection is definitely something that you want to think of and doing. At some point, perhaps surgery is required, and you start thinking about necrosectomy. In other words, you need to get in there and make sure that you prevent any further damage, and surgery might be last resort. Complications of acute pancreatitis locally. Something called phlegmon. Ill-defined fluid collection, usually sterile. Locally, acute pancreatitis. So think about where you are in the pancreas and pancreatic region, and all the different things that could occur locally as complications. The pseudocyst, talk about, remember, this is pseudocyst. Mean to say that it's not a true cyst. And the reason for that is because it's a non-epithelial wall. And by definition, a cyst has a pure or true epithelial wall. This, however, is a pseudocyst. If infection sets in, you're worried about pancreatic abscess, and you might have pseudoaneurysm of splenic artery. This is known as hemosecus pancreaticus and mean to say that you have hemorrhage taking place into it. These are local complications that you want to keep in mind for acute pancreatitis. Systemically, we've talked about a few of these already. 
If these enzymes and such then start getting into the respiratory system or pulmonary circulation, there's every possibility that ARDS might kick in. Next, kidney damage, renal failure, and with such severe volume deficit, may actually result in shock. And you're absolutely worried about DIC. Remember, keep this in mind from henceforth. I can only give you so many different angles for DIC, okay? And by that I mean DIC is an interesting, uh, it's an interesting beast. It really is. Uh, there are, for example, we've talked about M3, acute myelogenous leukemia, type 3 being DIC, amniotic fluid emboli, venom, sepsis being a common. What I'm saying is anything in which to the body there has been pretty massive uh, uh, alterations or even during pregnancy. Remember we talked about it with pregnancy, especially start getting into point of uh, uh, what's known as preeclampsia, eclampsia and such. Uh, you might be worried about DIC as well. So uh, what you're paying attention to truly is what is that major stress the patient might be then suffering or experiencing that all of a sudden whew, triggers DIC. It's dangerous. <laughs> 